Awesome. Okay. Uh, welcome, Shreya. Uh, this is our 18th episode on uh, machine learning for beginners. And for this podcast, we have Shreya Shankar, who is currently working as an ML engineer at BR Duct AI. And uh, she recently graduated from Stanford with her master's degree in computer science. And she has previously also worked at uh, Google Brain and Facebook as an intern. And she's also uh, leading an initiative called She++, which she will be talking much more about it in the later on this podcast. So um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Shia. Uh, welcome to this particular podcast. Yeah, and thanks for having me. Also, just to be clear, I, I'm finishing up my last class in my master's right now. I haven't yet graduated, but I will in a month or so. So Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's really interesting to know. I, I didn't know that. I, I, I thought you already graduated. Can you tell us uh, what are you currently working on? Like, uh, uh, what are you currently working at Viaduct as an ML engineer? Totally. So at Viaduct, we build machine learning pipelines for car companies, vehicle companies, OEMs. Um, and as a machine learning engineer, I help out with both building these the systems so that that data scientists can run algorithms to kind of I don't know make sense of the data, and also helping the data scientists create predictive models. Um, so that way I don't know we can solve problems like which vehicles are going to have component failures in the next few months or so. Right. Right. All right. And so, uh, so all these kind of technologies, like how, what was the inception point for uh, machine learning? Like when, how did you get started? Was it interns? Was it your undergrad study at Stanford? Uh, how did you get into machine learning basically? Yeah, I was lucky enough to go to Stanford, I think, which is kind of at the forefront of computer science, especially with like super amazing professors, classes, and research projects going on. Um, I think since I started school in 2015, um, 2016, 2017 were kind of like hype years, I think, for deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow 1.0 came out, whatnot. And I just found all of my peers and classmates taking these classes, um, like Andrew Ng's machine learning class. I think it's on Coursera also, and uh, Percy Liang's um, intro AI class. And I remember taking those my sophomore and junior years seeing everyone else doing machine learning projects. All of these classes have final projects, which are kind of machine learning, mini kind of a Kaggle projects. Um, and I think one thing led to another, I just kept following down the rabbit hole. Right, right. And what was, uh, so as a typical undergrad uh, engineer, uh, undergrad student, we really learn a lot of different concepts. It's uh, starting from infrastructure based, like database systems and infra how to build infrastructure, normal software development uh, domains. And also we have these mathematical domains where we learn the basics of AI. But what, according to you, really stood out that made you interested into machine learning on why not be a database engineer or why not... Um, be a very hardcore infrastructure engineer what was really unique for you for being interested into machine learning i think as an undergrad you're really impressionable and most of the people around me were in machine learning so i kind of gravitated towards that the thing that i actually studied though is computer systems so for example databases compilers operating systems security stuff like that i enjoyed doing that because i felt like it was very hard for me to learn machine learning concepts or learn other computing concepts without having some sort of fundamentals. So for example, like, I don't know, how does an operating system work? What are the principles behind, I don't know, like distributed computing, stuff like that. Cause I feel like all of this stuff applies to all of the new domains like machine learning. Um, yeah. Right, right. And uh, I also read one of your recent blog articles that relate that relates or talks much about the AI saviorism. And I, I when I look at a lot of startups in the Bay Area and typically other locations in the East Coast, a lot of uh, one line definition of all these startups say that we have a powerful AI at the core of this particular product. And uh, it really intrigues me like to understand what exactly they are using because it's not definitely a coca-cola recipe that's really patented but a lot of people like if you see most of these startups even if it's not a tech domain a lot of people use the word ai i don't know if if that makes them sound cool or not but you have seen a pretty diverse range of workplaces because you interned with facebook you interned with google uh, in a pretty pretty research aspect and uh, right now we are working at a young startup 
how do you find particular AI severism and how do you how do you go on approaching because yes there would be some problems that need AI as a solution but how do you really understand that hey this solution really doesn't need AI to barge in it's 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 a normal normal approach to be solved using other techniques how do you defend that I think it's definitely something I'm working on and only something I've recently picked up in the last few months or so um I think I outlined also in the article kind of the framework that I use now to approach working with non tech or non AI ML people and trying to construct predictive solutions. I think one of the biggest challenges for me is to wrap my head around how the client or the non ML person thinks about an ML solution. So they don't quite know the terms precision and recall in their head, for example, but they have an idea of like whether this ML model actually derives, it pr provides value. Like maybe they just really care about minimizing the number of false positives. Maybe they really care about minimizing the number of false negatives, like they're in a medical context or something. So kind of working with them to have a grasp of how to realistically evaluate a model, especially in real time and like a live or production setting, I think is um, harder for me usually than just like kind of building a classifier or something right and yeah that's that's totally a fair point and one of these things like also i i don't know it was maybe um, a point in your one of your articles too but terms like interpretability and explainability like because i'm i'm currently working on building an uh, interpretable ai model and what i when once we go through the literature of these particular terms a, the point that we first find is most of the people use explainability and interpretability very interchangeably. I mean, it's very convenient for anyone to say our system is explainable versus they saying our model is interpretable. So uh, for my first question would be, uh, do you see, like, do you have a definition in your mind, like based on whatever survey or whatever experience that you have been, do you like, do you have a clear distinction? What, what really means by achieving explainability versus achieving interpretability? Um, well, how do you define the difference? Um, a very naive, so please take this definition from a first year PhD student. Like um, I'm just a very newbie into this whole domain, but for me, what I understand is interpretability refers to model being interpretable as in making a, making a definition out of the mathematics of a model versus explainability typically refers on the surface level as in saying that this is what the model predicted and just answering why like it's like one of the interpretability refers to the model that is the architecture of the model but explainability is typically just concerned with the end end point of the model that is the predictions that's what my understanding currently has been Got it. So maybe like interpretability is a stepping stone to explainability. Because how are you going to get explainability if you don't know what the model is doing? Um, that makes a lot of sense. I think for me, I, I think these concepts are really important for two different reasons. One is for the data scientists or the ML practitioner. Like, how are they supposed to iterate on the model if they don't? have an idea for what the model is really good at and what the model is really bad at because they want to improve a model and if the black box only gives outputs and not any like direction on what you should try next like adding more features or adding more data or changing the objective function like all of these things like require some level of explainability um, and I think also from the client perspective, a lot of times in um, like applied ML context or when you're trying to uh, deploy like an actual useful model in the real world, um, the domain expert wants, uh, ha has some idea of I think, how to solve the prediction test. Like a great example is in the medical like literature of doctors can, they, they know like how to diagnose a patient with lung cancer based on I don't know, whatever x-rays or medical imaging devices, but these AI tools come in handy because they can enable what the doctors do at scale and provide, um, I think like checks, I guess, or confirmation that what the doctor is doing was right. Um, so the explainability really comes in where the, um, the AI solution has come up with something different than what a domain expert 
would have come up with. And it's like, who do you trust? Why? How do you, how do you build tools that augment what humans do rather than completely replace them altogether? Right, right. So, um, I mean, would you agree to the statement that achieving interpretability would be much more of a concern from both the ends of the uh, people who are associated with that product, one being the clients because they want they want a confidence in that particular model, and secondly, also the developers because they need to reiterate to understand why that particular model might be failing on at least 5% of the cases. So it would be helpful for them to debug that particular model. So would you agree to that particular uh, proposition? Yeah, totally. Um, I think it's very telling that a lot of ML models in production are like XGBoost or trees um, rather than deep learning or deep neural networks applied everywhere. Right, right, right. And um, one, one of my questions normally is, uh, because I, I started, like, at least my master's was definitely, uh, like my master's thesis was definitely along those lines, uh, where I had to at least spend more than six months just to understand what these domains are and catch up to the real world. That uh, once I have an idea and I Google and I already see a few papers on that particular aspect so it's really hard catching up to the latest research that goes on into these particular domains of a particular application and you are working definitely at an applied research domain so uh, you have to keep up with the latest models that really come up and definitely self-driving car is more than most of the focus of research so how do you have like what what works best for you how do you keep up with the latest trends uh in research, whether it be academia or whether research being done from industries, and how do you keep yourself updated on what is, what model is doing the best thing in that particular application? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that I'm trying to work with, work on over time as I've had to transition to industry and kind of when I was in school, my my I dialed up towards trying to keep up with academic research, and now it's like less on the academic research and more on the like industry blog posts, like whatever Uber, Lyft, like Michelangelo posts that come up and just random um, like Kubernetes posts and whatnot. Um, for me, I found that it's really useful to kind of pick a few subdomains of ML that I really deeply care about um, that may or may not be relevant to my job. Um, one being, I guess, like continual learning, I really, do care about um, how do you design neural networks and deep learning model or machine learning models in general to be robust to like data um, distribution shift or uh, learning new tasks or whatnot because all of that stuff is going to come up while you're doing live inference. Um, so continual learning is definitely one of them. Another one is model robustness and like adversarial examples. So I think having these two areas of focus makes me makes it easier for me to keep up with the literature in that area whether it's like through archive or looking at like recent iClear submissions or icml conference proceedings whatnot right right and yeah talking about narrowing narrowing down your area of research i i mean um correct me if i'm wrong but uh, i from from a very basic glance of your profile it looks like your internship at Facebook maybe gave you a very different perspective of understanding how to build good infrastructure versus how yeah, like your intern at Google gave you a very deep uh, perspective into how actual, like industry level research with a very high amount of intensity really looks like. Also Stanford must have played its role from an academia, like giving you a taste of what research in academia looks like. And right now we are working at a young startup that really deals with a lot of applied machine learning. Like they don't care if they, like the model has to be robust regardless of, like, I mean, I, I wouldn't say regardless of the accuracies, but robustness is definitely a key. So what is for you, for you, what do you think has been the most interesting thing that really keeps you on your feet that was it something like uh, academia research that you really enjoyed? And if not, why, why did you not enjoy or versus building infrastructure is really uh, that keeps you up at night or what, like, what, what is definitely our most interesting thing out of all these four domains that you can say? Yeah, I think that changes for me actually fairly regularly and something that I more subscribe to is kind of developing a set of principles for how I think 
the ML world should work and whether maybe there's like a lack in infrastructure that allows us to achieve that goal or a lack in research methods or a lack in like the disconnect between um, like ML practitioners and the people who are actually using the ML models. Like, yeah, I, it changes, I guess, depending on where the gap is. But I, I feel like a lot of the principles um, that have guided me have come through, I guess, like Stanford classes and these research um, experiences. I've found that the papers that I've really enjoyed the most are the simplest ones, the ones that are like few lines of code change, very simple concept, but uh, drastically improves results, um, things like that, because simplicity is what is actually used in the real world rather than like your ensemble of like a billion different um, neural network layers. Um, so yeah, for sure. I. And the same principle can be applied to infrastructure too. Um, like, I want, I, I would much rather use Apache tools because it keeps me in the same ecosystem, like Apache Spark and MLflow versus like a different tool from a different company that like could may or may not be experimental. Who knows? Uh, yeah. So sorry, I can't answer your question on like what is it that keeps me up at night, but. The general guiding principles, I think, of simplicity and how do you design the systems such that anybody can use them and iterate on them, um, whether that's from a research perspective or an infrastructure perspective, I think is important to me. Right, right. And yeah, when I see all of these four buckets of uh, jobs that are out there a typical question like uh, this is uh, this uh, this thing that I realized uh, maybe last year that most of the companies that have openings for machine learning engineers, I, I, I definitely feel the interview process for machine learning is definitely something that need, really needs to be worked on because to like, if you, if you are a person who is really uh, on a hiring end of the machine learning position, what would be, what would be an ideal candidate for you who can, who can really qualify for uh, a machine learning engineer in general? I'm not talking about specific to where you're working right now. Like if you are a person with a sufficient amount of experience, how would you rate a person based on his machine learning capabilities? How do you, like, what is the uh, measuring scale for you? Yeah, I wrote a thread on this a little while back, maybe a couple months ago, but the biggest things I look for for an ML engineer are, um, like, I feel like it's, like, the best parts of data science and the best parts of engineering, even though they don't need to be super deep in either domain. Like, I don't really care about what kinds of statistical tests they know or whatnot. It's for data science, like, can you, are you a good scientist? When you perform and design experiments, do you only change one thing at a time? Like, you'd be surprised, like a lot of people, like, I don't know, will, I don't know, change like 12 hyperparameters at the same time. And like, I don't really know what that's trying to measure. Um, but in general, like incrementality, I think is really important in data science and a good practice of science. And the rest will come, right? You can read like whatever O'Reilly practical uh, data science statistics for data scientists I think practical yeah practical statistics for data scientists you can read whatever books you want you can learn whatever um, statistical tests are ready to be used or like whatever objective functions like survival analysis or regression it, it, it doesn't matter right what matters is do you have the principles and the scientific methodology on that front and I think from a software engineering perspective I care a lot about well when they write their code, do they write it such that anybody can understand it? Because when you're an ML engineer, both software data engineers and data scientists need to understand what you're doing. Um, yeah, so can they write like code that people can understand? Can they write code that's reusable also? So for example, if I were to solve a problem, I should be I'm more inclined to reuse another ML engineer's code rather than write it from scratch myself. And I found that this isn't the case when you're like trying to replicate a but replicate ML research papers. Oftentimes it's like easier to actually do it yourself or re-implement it yourself than to use the code base they publish. Um, so that skill is definitely something um, that I look for. Yeah, definitely. I can definitely uh, second that on the last point that you made because um, even at our lab, when I'm trying to use uh, other people's uh, model that have they have, they have previously developed and they had great results. I mean, those papers are highly cited. But once I see their code, and I was like, oh man, I just like also I, they they were they were from a different domain. They were not from computer science, and I was like. like 
my mentor's expectation that because I'm a computer science student, uh, like the transition would be really easy for me to pick up that particular code. And I just had to read, like it, I took at least two or three weeks to maybe just um, rewrite it so that I can, I can really um, work with it. And one thing that I realized, like almost this is just a few weeks back and one of my uh, like other lab mates wanted to collaborate on that particular project. And I just gave him the code with the high expectation that, hey, I, I wrote a very beautiful code. And he like, I remember like the maybe the longest um, Slack conversation, making him understand what exactly that code means. <laughs> so I can imagine that, yes, working at a working at a com like big company young startup or anywhere in a very professional scale this really the, the problem scales itself on a very huge scale when you have a lot of people coming in from uh different uh backgrounds so yeah <laughs> i definitely second on the last point <laughs> yeah reproducibility and good good um coding skills are a must but um yeah um do you see a major difference like if you like although you worked as an intern at Google Brain and Facebook and right now at uh, VR Doc, do you like if you were to work at Google Brain for a long amount of time, the kind of person and the kind of person you would have built being a researcher at Google Brain, is it significantly different than maybe 10 years of your tenure at we are dot or like is it does it really take to be a different kind of person being a machine learning researcher at big companies or maybe a professor at stanford versus how a machine learning researcher works at young startups do you see a major major difference that needs to be learned if somebody was targeting one thing or the other i'm sure i would have ended up differently had i stated brain full-time I imagine or had I got directly to a PhD program you never know I think with these things um, part of the thing that's so interesting to me about a machine learning career path is that there's no right career path like for example in consulting there's a right career path you go to a top tier consulting company you stay there you get burned out you go to an MBA like, like the path is there for you and then you like end up I don't know as a CEO or something CEO um, but it's not there for machine learning. Um, it's unclear whether you should go to research or you go to industry or you, I don't know, switch to infrastructure, which which makes me believe that there's no right path actually. Like every path is the right path. Um, I don't know where I was going with this. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I would have ended up differently had I stayed at Brain. The other thing that really um, crossed my mind when I was trying to decide where to go full-time is when you're really young, or I guess in, in life in general, I read this one wonderful post that uh, says that whoever you surround yourself with, like try to diversify that and be careful who you surround yourself with every day because you're basically giving them right access to your brain, especially if you're early on in your career, like you want to diversify that as much as possible. And so that's what made me realize I want to try things and new things and if I don't like it, it's fine. I'm still early in career. Right. Yeah. And yeah, this brings me to uh, another interesting question. You you did mention that uh, you had you could you could have been a different person if you took a PhD. And uh, uh, one of the like I guess uh, I found out your profile based on that particular post of yours choosing industry versus PhD. And uh, so uh, can you can you like dig a bit more deeper on that like if for whom is phd a good choice versus for whom it is definitely not and what were your factors i mean uh, definitely i read the post so i i probably had that post by heart because i maybe read it two or three times because this was maybe just two one or two months into my phd and i was just still trying to figure out and pick up points from internet that says i i made a good choice so i was trying to get the pros out of your particular post but on a serious note like were like into your job work, job space that you have like you must have gained some experience and it's fine if you if you wouldn't mention out the cons of your current workspace or the applied machine learning domain how would you reflect back on choosing phd versus not yeah um i think for me I made the right decision at the time because I'm the kind of person that if I'm not fully committed and believe that the idea is a good idea, if there's any inkling of doubt, 
I'm not successful. So the very fact that I had an inkling of doubt two years ago would probably not have landed itself to success. I would have probably dropped out of the PhD program or something. Um, but I know other people are very different. So take that advice that you're like, some people do really well in like areas of ambiguity or they don't know for themselves, they're trying to explore it. But I know for me, like if I go to a PhD program, it's going to be because I 100% believe that that is the right choice for me. And there's no doubt um, at the time. I think the biggest pressures that a lot of people feel are um, a lot of the hype, I guess, in machine learning as a field centers around research and centers around key figures in research. So naturally the paths that we consider tend to be like a PhD or trying to do industry research or something like that, just because that's what Twitter is talking about. And that's what all of our friends are talking about. And that's what we read whenever we try to get into the field. I wonder if this would be different if um, machine learning practitioners were celebrated as much as machine learning researchers, like they were paid similar rates. I think it's ridiculous that these ML researchers at industry labs are paid like tens of millions of dollars like a year and they have stock. Mm. So um, yeah, just, I, I'm sure the conversation would be completely different if uh, the pay and the status and prestige were more equitable between the practitioners and the researchers in the industry. Hmm, that's that's really interesting because I mean I haven't definitely not browsed through the whole uh, job market for researchers versus uh, practitioners or just a normal normal software development engineer. But to my understanding, from based on what I research, I mean yes, there is. I mean definitely PhDs are paid a bit more than what. Uh, another experience level person would be but i do see like a very small nudge on top of the other like it's it just like doing a five years phd is just equivalent to having five years of software development engineer at some company or maybe just a little bit more than that i'm i'm not sure if uh, this varies from different companies to companies but that's what my observation has been like it's just a little bit more but nothing yeah. more than like phds are not revered to be uh, that hey it's it's a it's a money-making business for them i think you're right in expectation but the tail is much longer in the phds hmm. um and another thing that i think about is if you think about heroes of machine learning or the people that are recognized as role models most of them are all in research, rather whether they're professors or they're in industry research labs. Um, and that kind of probably unconsciously biases us into thinking those are the best paths. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that that is, yeah, I guess, yeah, the breakthroughs are still uh, regarded uh, as in terms of papers and models and accuracies instead of actually applying it to real world. So, yeah, uh, I agree on that point. That, partic that particular point is not re really praised into the um, domains. So, yeah, that's a fair point. And... Um, uh, so coming to the implementation aspects, you normally, like I see a lot of your tweets that really, really uh, talk much more about like the frustrations of doing such kind of implementations and uh, how it comes with it. Like as a researcher, I always find like, and this is maybe the most stereotypical question that what would be for you, PyTorch versus TensorFlow? Which one do you prefer? And why do you prefer that? Was it something uh, inherently because you interned at Google, so you have a soft corner for TensorFlow? Like, why not PyTorch? And, and, and like, uh, the question that I'm trying to come up to is, it, it really takes a lot of time if I wanted to master in TensorFlow. And it really takes a great deal of practice just sticking around TensorFlow and working on existing models, like learning from the scratch. And it's it's it takes a lot of time if I were a master in both of these frameworks. So how do you choose your frameworks and why do you choose them or they just happen to be there and it's like you had to do it and hence you learn. Like how? I love this question because most people don't, realize that the framework is not necessarily the only thing that dictates whether you use it or not. Like TensorFlow and PyTorch could literally be the same thing and still people would have their like preferences. And I think a big reason is, so to answer your question actually for myself, 
Um, whenever I'm doing personal research projects, PyTorch is my go-to. Whenever I'm writing code for other people to use at my company or for other people to understand, TensorFlow is my go-to, TF 2.0. And I think for me, like, because the factors are more than just like, whether it's easy for me to use the code. Like the factors are everything from like, what is the application? What is the idea? Do I care more about just iterating on this idea quickly or like coming up with like a nicely well thought out idea and implementation and sharing this with other people and having them understand it, and replicate it. Um, the framework I feel like is, or, or the, I guess, the oddities of a framework are like 1% of the large, the decision that needs to be made. Um, so I, I understand for research, like it makes total sense that most people prefer PyTorch because if they're the only people reading their code and they care about iterating much faster, um, totally, like I, I do that. I use PyTorch for myself, but for other people or when I'm working with really, really large data sets, uh, it's always TF for me. Right, right. And, and like, uh, can you walk us through like a very uh, typical instance that uh, what does what does a day look like for an applied machine learning engineer at Viaduct? Like how, what is a normal, I don't know if there are sprints or not, like what is, what is normally a month, uh, a day would be a very uh, bad example, <laughs> but like maybe a month, like what are, what are the kind of assignments that you get? How do you deal with it? And what is the end factor of that gratification that, hey, I completed it and you who uh, some kind of moment. So like, can you walk us to like, how do you get, like at least for software developments, they have these kind of fixes that they work on and hence like their work is being done. Like what is, what, what does that look like for an applied machine learning engineer? Yeah, definitely. We also operate, our startup also operates in the agile framework. And one of their biggest challenges is to try to, um, I don't know, turn ML projects into something that can be worked on in the agile framework. Like how do you design sprints around ML or how do you design like epics and all of these things? Uh, for me personally, I, I think that my my day or month in a life of me as an ML engineer is very different from months in a life of other ML engineers. I personally believe in kind of like my time as a portfolio and <laughs> it sounds terrible, but I want to invest my time in like different types. Um, of projects. So like, I will always have like a moonshot project going on. I will always have a like definite, I know I can do this project going on. And then I always, it's usually like two projects I am like seriously invested in and the other, I spend the rest of my time like collaborating with others, sharing my results with them, helping others on their projects, seeing where I can be of help in other places. So. Uh, most of my moonshot projects are like uh, take like state of the art research and like see what it can do. And then most of my um, like definite, I know I can do these projects or like I know I can win from this project is uh, more, it's closer to actually data engineering and like building robust pipelines, software stuff rather than like promising some result on an ML model. Right, right. And what would be a typical nightmare for an applied researcher, like for at least for people like us who are, I mean, I'm still relatively new, but for me, a nightmare as a researcher, an academic researcher would be not able to implement a model that has a theoretical proof, but that would be a nightmare for me, like, hey, I'm not able to do that. Or maybe for a infrastructure based engineer, it would be just not able to fix that bug. What is a nightmare for an applied researcher? Applied I'm sure research. it's different for everybody. The The biggest nightmares for me are when I feel like I don't have agency over what I'm doing. <laughs> so for example, like I believe that this is the project that will help us the most and somebody else tells me that's not true and they want me to work on something else. Like that is just the biggest nightmare for me, but um, probably it speaks more to my personality than like actually to my role. Right, right. And uh, so like you did talk about um, you, uh, you trying to work out and choosing models to like basically experimenting with models. So like, if if let's say, uh, like, how does this work? And this is maybe uh, personal advice that I would like to take it and take it and learn from people like you is if, if there is a problem set that says that, hey, I just want to do an object detecting object detection task and uh, that is being assigned to the, your to, to you how do you go on like do you do you 
do you see which is the latest model that gives the best results or would you say uh, because the uh, company uses tensorflow as a framework which is the which is the best model that were uh, that works best in tensorflow or versus do you really play along the constraints of that particular uh, assignment like how do you go on choosing like researching which models are best and picking one of them because i'm sure there is not just one model who performs the best right uh, every yeah. every model performs best in their particular strengths how do you go on choosing them i think in the industry setting part of your job as an mle is to understand what exactly the acceptance criteria is for your task when i define when i say acceptance criteria i mean like what is the bare minimum requirement for your task so when somebody says like object detection i want object detection like it's part of an mle's job i think to like push more on like what kinds of objects do you want to detect how good is good enough for you um and then for me personally what i do is like whenever i have those requirements in my head i'm like okay what is like the bare minimum dumb thing i can do to like achieve that quickly um and then if it comes like if i have extra time like let me, I don't know, build something better or use the state of the art or like whatever. So a lot of the times it's actually doesn't necessarily mean that machine learning is the best solution in the beginning. Like maybe if they only care about like object detection or like, I don't know, any squares that are brown or something or any squares that are pink. Like why do you need a machine learning model? Just compute that yourself and then design the pipeline around that and have the machine learning model or your function just be something that you insert in the pipeline uh, yeah so i guess that's how i go about it. right 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 yeah that's that's a fair enough point that's a nice enough um instance to understand and um in your opinion i i know this is i i mean i don't normally tend to ask this question but i see the value in this particular question is how do you see these f- fields converging? I mean, um, in your opinion, what is the most hotshot application of deep learning in various domains? So, for example, computer vision or NLP, because that's what we see, right? I mean, we as re- I mean, we I, I'm as a student, I just see if if I see computer vision, uh, a classic application that 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 just pops into head is uh, self driving cars because. All companies and big investments are just going at it like they just want those things done. Like things like medical imaging and all those are like just a silent players into these domains. And when we talk about NLPs, conversational bots and conversational AI developments are really on the surface of these things. So, do you believe, uh, like in your opinion, do you do you think do you think there is a particular interest from an industry's in, uh, standpoint? that that is the hot shot area of research and uh, development and if it is what it is for you or maybe there are a few other domains that are equally interesting and people should have a look out that hey you we should have a look out on that particular thing too i feel like this changes on a yearly basis um and it's really hard to measure what is the most hyped thing? Like, do you measure it by the number of NeurIPS papers? Do you measure it by the amount of VC funding? Do you measure it by the H index of the researchers working in that field? Like, this is a really hard question. Like for myself, I noticed that the last five years or so have been like, the the advances have, the the hype has really come, gone from like computer vision, like object detection or image recognition, for example, then to like, I don't know, um, adversary examples were super hot for a second. Meta learning was super hot for a second. Um, Maybe it's still hot, to be honest. Um, What else? Like hardware improvements, like TPUs, for example. Uh, Like just just all of these things, right? Um, The transformers and NLP, like there are all these moments that come up and it goes so fast that I feel like it's really hard to, I don't even know if it's a good use of time to try to like, predict the next one uh, because the upside I think to like if you're in a re- you're a researcher in this space is like even if you missed the next the last big thing like people will forget about it anyways for the next year so like keep working on whatever you believe is like important for whatever vision that you see in the space yeah I mean typically I ask that example because um, most of the people like 
at least when I was deciding that I want to do a PhD and most of my work, even being a computer science student, most of my projects are along the lines of uh, detecting long-term diseases like Al Alzheimer's, migraine, and we are, we are using, we are achieving that using deep learning. And, um, uh, Whenever I ask someone who did PhD a few years back and the only thing that they advise is just hope that whatever you worked on is still relevant after 10 years. And I was <laughs> like, why should, why wouldn't it be relevant? I mean, I mean, people would be still struggling with Alzheimer's, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a solvable disease. And it was like, you don't know about PhDs. Uh, you don't know about research then things go out of out of the coolness and they like once in a very million areas of research that PhDs work on, they come back and uh, it really feels nice like if you if you see the whole profile of Yan Likun it's it's like he did he did he did all those things few years back and it was just a coincidence that it, it came up and all these right. things really brightened up so yeah that was the whole uh, idea of that question that <laughs> is there something a convergence convergence point like everybody is really interested into it but yeah I mean it's it's really hard to pin down any one topic like you said but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Everyone seems to be interested in AGI, but nobody can really articulate to me like the common definition of AGI that's used amongst the community. So I kind of like if if that's something that's interesting to you, like define it, figure out what that means, and then chart your path to get there. And I would say like all of the side stuff is a distraction. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that actually like two topics that um uh, that really like itself if you see papers on interpretability by leading experts and who are who claim they are working on interpretability they itself state in their papers like getting the definition of interpretability is itself a big step towards achieving that because <laughs> most of the papers that you read they they very loosely defined and they have that term in a very English grammatical manner that says there is no staple definition of interpretability and it varies from application to application from user to user and the combination of application and user so <laughs> yeah and yeah. same goes for AGI uh, nobody really knows but yeah yeah most of the people are still afraid of getting a, a AI in the form of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger so hey. that's so funny yeah <laughs> so yeah and uh, talking about initiatives, uh, can you talk more about the uh, plus plus initiative? What does it really, uh, what does it really uh, is about, and how, what are you doing in that for? Yeah, I was a co-director of plus plus when I was an undergrad, and I graduated, so now I'm not actively involved in plus plus anymore. But our mission was to kind of rebrand what it means to be a technologist um, or a computer scientist, and it's motivated by, I think. Um, just this idea of like, you can't be what you can't see. So at least like when I was young and I know a lot of people similar to me, like didn't consider that like engineering is, or software engineering, computer science is like a job that we could have because we didn't see anyone like ourselves in it. Um, so as part of She Plus Plus, the biggest thing that I did was organize a program for high school students to come to Silicon Valley, um, have a mentor, um, like tour tech companies as well as research labs and kind of for, for me the most important thing was like introducing them to a lot of diverse people in the space just so you can like plant the idea in their head that like they can be a computer scientist I don't think you have to like explain like oh computer science is cool you should do computer science all that will follow if that's something that they're naturally interested in but the biggest barrier I see to women and minorities not pursuing the field is just they literally don't even consider it an option for them right right and is there is there a way people like is that initiative still active like is there a way people can um be a part of it or maybe just um uh, like how do they engage with that initiative is that a is it still active and if it is yeah how, how can people interact with that i think it's hard now because of covid so all the programs have kind of shut down um but if you check the website uh and the, they follow the facebook page i think because we post updates on there um and I'm sure hopefully next year, next school year, um, programs will start back up and we'll have the mentorship program coming back. So that would be awesome. And is it uh, specific to uh, Stanford uh, colleagues or is it? Uh, oh, it? no, is anyone. It... Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. you could sign up to be a mentor and any high school student can sign up to be a mentee. Awesome. Awesome. And yeah, this bring, brings me to the last question that is maybe the most uh, open-ended question and feel free to uh take a turn as as you would like to is 
uh, I, I get this question frequently and I'm still not able to answer this. So um, I'll be pivoting if you can answer is if uh, if you are a newbie into the computer science domain, you you learn a lot of things and you get to explore a lot of things. But at the same time, it could be intimidating. Like whether do I learn uh, web development? Do I learn back end development, front end development, database engineer, infrastructure, <laughs> AI and all those stuff? How how can one go on choosing what like choosing his or her interest and how can one really build a profile into it? is it is it uh, working at labs is it working at uh, good internships is it working at startups and first of all finding the interest and how to cultivate an interest so that uh, they can really stand out in the industry how can one go on from point zero to point B uh, point A to point B. Yeah, that's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so I think for people that are new in CS, I think there's two ways to really go about par carving the path for you. One way is you you explore CS, you take the entry classes, whatever, you find your interests. Like maybe you find that you're really interested in web development or you find that you're interested in databases or something. And like, kudos to you, like, great job you found an interest like go explore that but a lot of people myself included like didn't know don't know what they're interested in like i didn't know what i was interested in i could take all the classes in the world and i'd be like yeah that was cool okay now how do i where, what's my interest um and the thing that really helped me was to solidify kind of how i approached my thought process around computer science and to do that like i went and like found people that i really admired or really respected and doesn't matter if I know anything about their work or if I am interested in that field or not. Like go work with them, see how they approach problems and maybe you'll get really interested in that. Because what I found for me is I'm interested in areas that like a certain person I know really well is also deeply interested in, deeply passionate about and kind of can share that passion with me. Um, so it's, it's a roundabout way I think to finding an interest, but like find interesting people and then like, I, something will somebody i think will introduce you to the thing that you're interested in um so that's one another thing that i think has been a guiding principle for me is computers are interesting because um, they do exactly what you tell them to and the statement has a lot of implications because it means like whenever you run into a bug or something unexpected comes out like I think it's interesting. It's fun because it's not the computer's fault, right? It's usually because there is some assumption going on that you had, or maybe that like an implicit assumption that you had um, that you get to like uncover and understand more. So a lot of the things around like debugging ML pipelines, like if all of a sudden our outputs are not expected, it's not because the ML model was wrong. It was maybe because our assumptions about the data, input data, were incorrect or our assumptions about what the model would do and it saw outliers was incorrect or something. So it's, it's a very fun puzzle, I think, to always be solving. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, like you mentioned, it's, it's, yeah, there is no, like, it's going to be always a brute force approach that one needs to uh, do in order to find what, what really interests him or her. And yeah, yeah, I definitely understand. Like that is the, I guess that is the only selling point for like, one of the, one of the selling points for uh, computer science engineer is like, you can literally write an algorithm and make that particular uh, machine do whatever you want. And once you try to see that most of these applications are just a set of rules that people have defined. And that's that's really interesting. And that's what really hooks up uh, most of the students to this particular domain. So yeah, that's that's a very interesting perspective to that. But yeah, with that, uh, I guess I didn't have any more questions. Uh, would you have any other general tips of uh, surviving computer science uh, domain as in uh, any any general tips that you wished you had known a few years back? Any mistakes that you made that uh, you would like other people to not make in order to be yeah. a much more sa sane person? I think two big things that I learned is one, make friends in the area that you're in. Uh, I would definitely not be in computer science if not for all the friends that I spent the late nights with debugging programs or like just talking about uh, new technologies or new research papers with just because 
um, to make the friends, find whatever it takes to find that community. And then the other thing um, I think is, <laughs> I tell this to a lot of new Stanford grads now, or like juniors and seniors at Stanford who are like going through the job searching process now um, for when they graduate or internship hunt and they don't know what to do. It's like, don't take yourself that seriously. You're bound to make mistakes. Like just, just do like pick something, it's fine. If something doesn't work your way, like that's also fine. I made a big mistake of like just taking myself so seriously in undergrad and trying to get good grades and good research and like all of that stuff. I don't even know how much that matters in the long run, as long as like you're happy and you find something that you work on or you're happy in the moment as you're working on something. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's one thing that yeah, I'm, I'm I can see myself transitioning to that particular phase. The kind of failures are okay. Just try to learn from that thing. I'm I'm still the kind of person who still goes after grades, so I need to be on that particular trajectory. That uh, yeah, grades don't really matter, but it's 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 really hard to get out of the mental space that totally. grades do matter. But yeah, yeah, but yeah, um. Anyways, um, I mean, yeah, that I think that has this this has been probably one of the most uh, uh, interesting conversations because I I really wish I, I I'm particularly generally very interested to talk to applied researchers rather than pro researchers or pro software development people infrastructure or domain because applied researchers like they kind of juggle with uh, the pros and cons of both these domains so it's really interesting to learn from people like you so yeah uh, thanks a lot for um, agreeing to this i know it's a weekend but yeah thanks thanks a lot for doing this particular podcast thanks for having me this was really fun <laughs>